The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. This Friday has been way more news than I expected, and it's been awful news. I've just seen so many terrible headlines, and they keep creeping up on us, Matt. We have a lot to discuss. But before we get into that, how are you doing right now? <laughs> I I think I'm handling the news well. I don't know. It's like every week at this point, it's something crazy. But uh, yeah, ready to get into it. Let's Let's crack. Yes, we will discuss the block and its relationship to FTX, the demised exchange ran by Ponzi boy SBF. Then we're going to talk about Argo blockchain, which may or may not be filing for chapter 11 this coming Monday. At the very least, they've halted trading on the London Stock Exchange. And we'll finish up with a little bit of a rub between the Brains community and Riot blockchain after Riot decided to switch mining pools due to a bad, unlucky, I should say, an unlucky month for the brains pool. So we got three stories coming to you in the next 10 minutes. We'll start off with the block and I'll probably keep this uh, since Matt actually was just on an Uber and I just heard about this. We're recording this maybe an hour or two after this came out, but I'm a little bit more intimately involved with the details given past history, uh, having known a lot of people at the block and having worked at Coindesk. So The backstory here, or the headline I should actually start off with, is the fact that the Block's CEO was taking out loans from Sam Bankman-Fried and Alameda in order to fund the continuous existence of the Block. For backstory, Mike McCaffrey was the former CEO of the Block. He stepped down this afternoon, Friday, December 9th, so just actually a few hours before we recorded this episode. He stepped down because he did not disclose the relationship between SBF, FTX, and Alameda, and The Block. The Block, of course, is one of the larger news organizations in crypto that has been covering that subject matter pretty closely. Uh, These loans were, again, used to fund the continuous existence of The Block. Uh, Reportedly, there is no relationship between the business end and the editorial side of The Block. And so the familiar faces over at The Block were not involved or did not have details of this arrangement. That being said, it's a horrendous thing, especially since the block pitched itself as someone that could be trusted as someone that was uh, that someone that had integrity in the space. And I think the people who work there, the editors and the journalists, I have high regard for. Uh, but this business structure was certainly unwelcome. Uh, it's basically blowing up on crypto Twitter right now, and will have far-reaching repercussions, especially for how crypto media is seen within other media circles, and then how serious this industry is taken. Boot it over to you for your take on it. Yeah, this this one was a shock for me, but I can't help but feel some like palpable irony in this story because throughout the whole FTX, Sam Bankman Freed blow up, I feel like the coverage was very much so done by independent sort of journalists on Twitter. We're in real time, we're finding out stories and things. And then we have this like potential um per- perspective skew from what like one of the major news outlets in the space that could have been favored by SBF because there were these loan engagements right and there's just general i think and i speak anecdotally from you know having friends in the space and having worked in it for a while that there's just a general distrust of corporate media and just general um propaganda right that gets pushed in the general ethos of news and so to have it now, you know, infiltrated our industry itself. And with this story, now it is the potential of this, right? I guess, as you uh, rightly put there, you know, blo- the block is sort of separate from, I guess, this business that McCaffrey was running himself. But nonetheless, he was the CEO of this company and had this relationship with SBF, who at this point, I don't think anybody could argue is not just an outright fraudster. 
So I don't know. This is a really interesting story. I can't believe that it just kind of broke today going into the weekend. And I can't wait to find out more. Yeah, no, frankly, just from knowing people at the block, um, knowing people in the general media space, like there's a lot of frustration with this story. I think it casts a shadow on a lot of people who are trying to do good work in crypto media and especially like the very excellent reporters and editors over at the block who are now going to have to deal with this stain on their reputation because someone decided to get greedy. Uh, Mike McCaffrey even took out uh, or had real estate from SBF. And that's something that we're finding out more and more is that FTX was buying up real estate in the Bahamas, giving it to employees for large discounts, maybe not even making them pay. I mean, SBF even had real estate given to his parents, right? So it seems that the block was entangled in this due to the actions of their CEO. There's a lot of questions to come out of this. I'm uh, sure that the reporters at the block and the editors will do their best to uh, give that information out. I think the question now is what about the financial health of the block, given that they had these loans out in order to essentially maybe float the company along? Um, for the most part, people thought that the block was financially healthy because of its research arm, which had a lot of institutional clients and still has a lot of institutional clients and then ad revenue. But that might not be the case, right? These loans might have been holding up the entire book. So there there could be some turbulence ahead. Wishing the best for the block and for anyone who likes their readership. I think they do an excellent job at the space, especially covering the mining sector. Any final thoughts on that? Yeah, I have I have a question for you because I'm going to address the, the elephant in the room. And you used to work at Coindesk. And at the very start of my sort of crypto career, I did a small stint there as well. And it's felt like there's always been some sort of a shadow over Coindesk that it is under the sub, it is a subsidiary under the sort of parent guise of DCG. And some people, I'm not saying myself, but some people in the space have expressed opinions that um, this could potentially give news favor to uh, you know DCG, sort of the parent company, and uh, affect kind of the truth of of journalism behind it. Do you think that there could possibly be any sort of influence from a top-down level on what is actually done in what's being reported um, through how people are conducting their sort of independent research, how they're expressing it to the public, you know, et cetera? I just kind of want to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, no, for my time at Coindesk, there was never any involvement. I remember actually emailing Barry Silver once for a story. And he just emailed me back and said, please talk to comms. Like, that's it. That's how it normally was done. Like, DCG is a separate entity. And rightfully so that people are skeptical about their relationship, and they should. But I think the FTX story uh, that Ian Allison from Coindesk blew up earlier this, I guess, last month now, that's December, in November, really proves that there's a separation there. A DCG is weakened. Right? Genesis might go into bankruptcy. And that is one of the largest arms of DCG. And that's because of its sister company, Coindesk's reporting. For the block, I think we just need more information specifically about its financials, right? It's difficult to believe that all the money was in the hands of someone our age, frankly, a 150 person plus company that was trying to become the Bloomberg of crypto. I mean, that was what their pitch has been for quite a while, has been in the hands of 20 something. And he was running this whole thing and other people were not aware of the financials. Uh, that's plausible, but I definitely have a lot of questions about that. And I'd like to see more on in terms of like the relationship between SBF, FTX, Alameda, the blocks coverage was certainly very favorable at times. And they even boasted about how well they covered FTX and how early they were to FTX. There's lots of Twitter um, remarks from Frank Chaparro and others. That being said, that doesn't really prove anything, right? I, I don't think a lot of people understood that FTX was the fraud that it was. Uh, so it's it's hard to say. I think we need more information. At the very least, it's gut-wrenching this morning, and I feel for those teams. But we got more news to coverage uh, to cover. It's even worse news. Well, maybe not. Go ahead. I just want to say I certainly have a lot of respect for a lot of the reporters at the block, and I hope this turns out to be sort of a big uh, nothing burger, especially because of how important it is to have sources of truth in like a space that's constantly undergoing change and that has just all sorts of interesting things happening. Um, but you sort of have the the scoop on this next story relating to Argo. You kind of broke it on Twitter, so I'm going to hand it back to you. Yeah, somewhat of a break. Uh, someone sent me this message on Telegram 
But Argo blockchain suspended trading of its, or actually its stock was suspended by the London Stock Exchange this morning, December 9th, for trading after its monthly report for November came in very poorly. I'll kick it over to you in a second to get those numbers. Uh, but then there was also a screenshot of a possible Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing floating around on social media. Apparently, this was sent out to a few investors early by accident. It's supposed to be sent out next week on Monday. December 12th, but that did not occur. Uh, there seemed to be some sort of accidental publishing and then it was later deleted. So maybe this occurs, maybe it doesn't occur, but at the very least it's out there and there's been no response to date about if it's in fact true. And this, of course, follows the suspending of trading for the stock, which typically occurs, right? You suspend the trading and then you announce some financial news. So those two things are pretty bad. Going to kick it over to you, though, for updates on the monthly numbers for Argo blockchain and then maybe some context on how this all came to pass. Yeah, I mean, if the story is true, right, we don't know. It's just rumor. But my immediate question comes to why are they in this position? How did we get here? And I think it's kind of uh, much the same story about miners not making necessarily the best treasury management decisions when they could have in the bull period when Bitcoin price was sort of electrically running off and it was not as difficult to generate Bitcoin. Um, and so they could have, you know, sold their Bitcoin and sort of generated more cash and had a more prudent strategy. But instead, the sort of hodl dynamic, the urge to hold coins because you're so bullish on Bitcoin ended up kind of hurting them in the long run. Um, and I think we see that played out actually with Argo pretty well. I got the numbers in front of me here. In January, they were holding um, about 2,700 coins. And then throughout this year, up until this point, um, they had significantly selling, especially starting in the summer months, June, July, August. But now they've drawn down their holdings to about 100 coins. It says in their monthly update, uh, I think 216 Bitcoin and Bitcoin equivalents. But of that, that they say is actual Bitcoin is just 100 coins. So they've drawn down their treasury, right? They've sold um, much of the coins that they had on their balance sheet and a complete reverse strategy in 2021. It was all holding. Their reserves will, were growing upwards. And then uh, you know something else to note that I just have sort of anecdotally observed in, in sort of past reportings is that they were buying spot electricity agreements or spot electricity prices. They weren't didn't necessarily have fixed rate PPAs in place. As we know, due to sort of energy... Uh, global energy, I guess, crisis, you could call it, or just, you know, general uh, challenges in that space, electricity prices across the, across the board have surged. Um, and so they might be just marginally on the higher end of the cost curve as a miner. So I think that's much of the story of how they could potentially got here. But of course, interested to see if there is actually a filing, right? This is actually true. Um, but definitely a couple sort of headwinds that they're facing. I'll, I'll send it back to you. Yeah, I think you have the classic problem here with minor economics, bad Bitcoin price, high energy rates, and then mounting difficulty it means you can't run a mining business uh, with very thin margin. Uh, things are going to start collapsing, and they certainly have collapsed for a lot of people in Texas. Uh, there's a great chart, I think we showed it last week, showing all the different mines going online in Texas, and many of them were booming and are now busting. We'll see what ends up happening with all those mega mines. For Argo blockchain, the largest one is the Helios site in Texas, uh, which has faced a lot of issues because it's supplied by natural gas. Price of natural gas has tripled in some cases in Texas, which means it's often not profitable to mine at that point. So uh, what was going to be a big cash cow for the company went south and sour. And to me, this is just a story of mining economics. It's unfortunate. Argo blockchain had a lot of talent. Hopefully they're able to restructure. I think that's a big thing here is First, we don't know if Chapter 11 is happening, so I wanted to make that clear. Second, if it does happen, a lot of times that's restructuring. Argo Blockchain still has a lot of assets and a lot of talent and a lot of great spots to mine at. So hopefully they can just restructure and fare through this, but we shall see. Let's move over to our last subject for the day, which is a little tiff between Riot Blockchain and the Brains community. Riot Blockchain was using Brains for its main pool, but Brains had a unlucky month leading to Riot Blockchain not getting as many Bitcoin as they wanted. Riot Blockchain has now made it known that they plan on moving to a different mining pool. We don't know which one at this point. Likely Foundry based on what others 
large entities use and what the payout structure uh, Riot is going to want. But we don't quite know that yet. We'll have to wait. Why is this news? Well, actually, I want to kick it over to you to get your take on that. A lot of people saw this and thought it was unfair for it to be reported that it was hurting the brains community. My stance is it's a mining beat. You got to cover mining news. And Riot's the largest miner in North America now. So it's, it's notable to see like what service providers they use. Yeah, I mean, I guess to answer the why question, it's because Riot's a, a big fish. They have a lot of hash rate. Um, you know, and like... I guess it's worth saying, right? Why do miners join pools in the first place? It's kind of to lower their variance of getting paid. Um, and so if pools are coordinating uh, a group of miners in their hash rate, they have a higher chance of capturing block rewards than if a miner was just mining themselves, right? And just um, sort of getting paid out on sort of that schedule, but instead being grouped together, um, the pool could win more block rewards and, and the miner can get paid out more regularly. I think just like to take a historic view, we don't know if Brains is, is really in trouble. This could be a complete nothing burger of a story. Um, that being said, it's worth noting that there's been high turnover as far as what mining pools are actually active and coordinating hash rate in the Bitcoin network. You can go back to um, there, some major monster mining pools like in the early days talking about deep bit and BTC guild um, had, you know, around upwards of, of 30% of network cash rate in their pool to even higher. There was a major stint with ghash.io. There's a lot of people probably listening out there that have no clue what I am talking about what those pools are because they're no longer around. Will right. And they were the biggest players in the mining pool space. We can even go back to just when um, the, the uh, China mining ban happened last year. Several pools went down. Um, I, I dug up a few here. Uh, Lubian, BTC.top, uh, 1T hash, all you know, sort of ostensibly ceased operations. Um, and they were sort of formerly um, you know, providing services to miners as a pool. So like turnover happens quickly in the space. It's it's relatively easy for a miner to redirect their hash rate to another pool. Riot could come out next week and say they're going back to brains, right? And on sort of an operational uh, level, it's it's not a tall task. Uh, there, there's not a lot of tension there. Um, so, I mean, I, I hope that provides some, I guess, historic context, but I don't necessarily know how big of a story this is unless brain come, Brains comes out and says that they're having some real issues. Yeah, and I don't think we know anything about that right now. It's definitely not uh, speculating on it. I, I think it's just a story because Riot's so large and we do care who the service providers are. Uh, it's interesting on that case alone. And I, I think the other point I want to bring up is just the fact that we have these these big pubcos in mining now that are dollar denominated, but they operate in a Bitcoin business. And we have these mining pools, which are oftentimes more Bitcoin centric companies. And sometimes there's not a very good way for the two to operate together. But big dollar denominated companies, they want generalized projections are going to be correct. And if they're not correct, then they will change service providers. Bitcoin companies, they operate in the Bitcoin world. They expect the next block to happen in 10 minutes. But you know, if you have an unlucky month mining, well, that's an unlucky month. You might have a more lucky month the next month. And that's how it is. Uh, that's how they build their structures for the companies. So I think there can be some friction between the two models there. And that's just how it is. I think we'll see maybe in the future better ways for those two types of companies to align. Well, let's close up there unless you have any final thoughts on the subject. Last tonight. note popped into my head. Foundry USA pool wasn't even around, uh, call it two years ago, right? Really started to grow right after the uh, China mining ban. They're now the largest uh, Bitcoin mining pool out there. So change happens fast and frequently in the space. And so, again, I don't think this is a big deal, but it's just worth noting because of how much hash rate Riot has behind it. So it really speaks to perhaps just the growth of public listed mining company hash rate. That's my last word. My last word is stay safe out there. Uh, it's been a pretty crazy two months and I'm sure it's only going to get a little bit more intense. Uh, but heading into the holidays, maybe take some time offline. That being said, we do have some awesome podcast guests coming up over the next few weeks, including some great holiday specials. One that I'm looking forward to is Coin Metrics. And the mining pod are teaming up to go over end of year numbers on December 21st. It's going to be a live stream. So do check in for that. We will send out additional information, which you can find on the Compass 
Twitter account, my Twitter account, or in other various places. We'll go over end of year numbers with the CoinMetrics team. We love talking with those guys. But from all of us on the Mining Pod, Matt and I, thanks for listening. See you later. Cheers.